What's up, everyone? Welcome into the All 22 podcast, the official podcast of the All 22 fantasy football platform. It is the only fantasy football game with full 53 man rosters, including offensive linemen, where you get to choose personnel packages and have access to PFF grading and advanced stats to make decisions each week. Ray, it's been uh, it's been like seven days or something like that since we've done this. I am so excited to be back. And there's some big news in the trade market before we even jump into the daily topic of the day, which is the edge position of the draft. We are an all 22 podcast. Like you said to me earlier, we need to be talking about what's happening in the fantasy football world, which is Stefan Diggs is traded to the Houston Texans for a second round pick. And uh, he actually gets the rest of his contract essentially voided by the Texans in upon his request, right? So Diggs will be a free agent after this year, Texans trade essentially a second round pick for Diggs. a couple late picks. I believe they're getting in return. Uh, what do you think of all this? I like it a lot for pretty much everybody. I think I, I think I like it for absolutely everybody. Um, let's start with Diggs because that's the, the the main topic of conversation, right? That's what everybody wants to know about. And I think this goes for every format, not necessarily just all 22 either. But the switch to Joe Brady at offensive coordinator for the Bills, I think was the right move for sure. It was a great move. But... His MO, his being Brady's, is not necessarily to highlight or feature a primary or premier target, right? So we saw Diggs' numbers dip. The efficiency wasn't quite there either, um, but that was the big catalyst to Diggs' performance, right? And so if that's not going to work, again, just for Diggs, then by all means, I love the spot in Houston as well. The fit there is phenomenal. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Bobby Slowick and how he schemes things up for everybody. I think the big thing too that's going to help Stefan Diggs more than anything else is the downfield threats that they have in Houston as well that can open things up for him. So of receivers with 65 or more targets last year, right? Tank Dell was seventh in a dot. Okay. So we think of him as like, just because of his size, a small slot receiver who can get some quick separation and like an occasional deep pass. This guy is a certified deep threat. And so is Nico Collins in his own right, but not quite as pronounced. That is huge for Stefan Diggs. A lot of people are talking about like, Oh, there's too many mouths to feed in Houston. There's so many mouths. To feed. No, there's not. That, that's exactly what you want. A really good trio at wide receiver. And Diggs is the clear number one guy there, at least for this upcoming season. Okay. Dalton Schultz is not a guy that that's not a mouth you have to feed. That's a guy who is who benefits from and adds on top of what you have at that wide receiver position from his tight end spot. He's not someone that you go into the game, uh, you know, the game that week saying, "Oh, we we, we got to get Dalton Schultz the ball." No, that's not how it works in Houston. It's it's just not, especially with these weapons there now. So I love the fit. I don't think. I'm not concerned at all with too many mouths to feed in Houston. It's a dome. It's a phenomenal offensive coordinator. I love Bobby Slovak. I think he's going to be a head coach in 12 months. And for Diggs, I think it ups his ceiling for 2024, which is probably what you were looking at anyway, given his age. He's 30 now, right? So you probably only have realistically one premier league or premier year left. Say premier year as fast as you can a couple of times before you step up, uh, you slip up there. One premier year left of Stefan Diggs. And I don't think he could have gone into a better situation than this. I like it a lot for uh, everyone as well. I, the only thing I'll say is, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm going to get into a little bit of recency bias, but the teams that made it to the championship this year were the Chiefs, Ravens, Lions, 49ers. There are some really good receivers on those teams, but they don't treat any single one of them as a mouth they have to feed. That's what you were saying about Dalton Schultz, but in reality, the best teams don't feed a mouth. They feed everyone, right? They do what's best for the team. And you look at like the 49ers who have Debo, George Kittle, Ayuk, Christian McCaffrey. Like they don't feed any single one of those guys. Those guys do their job every day. And that's what makes that team successful, right? I think that this could be a really good move for the Texans if Diggs is willing to play that type of football. Because... Nico Collins and Tank Dell and Dalton Schultz are also good football players. So if he's willing to take that role as the goal of this is to win, that team will be very successful. If he goes into this acting a little bit of the way he was when he was with the Bills, which is I'm that dude and you need to get me the ball, it will not, right? And I think that's what the Bills kind of had to come to Jesus moment and realized, right? Is 
our team is not going to be better having one really good receiver. Our team's going to be better having three or four guys that want the team to win. So them getting that second round pick, they still have their first round pick. I would love it. I would absolutely love it because the Bills are good enough right now as it is to just go and win football games, right? You add on two really good rookie receivers in this draft that if you got guys that just want to go out there and win football games, that's going to be, a, in my opinion, a better football team without Diggs than it was with it. But it doesn't mean that it makes the Texans worse. If Diggs, again, changes his attitude a little bit, which, you know, like I, I think it might be a little overblown, but I, I, that could be a great situation for them too. I, I like it on both sides. Um, being a Packers fan, right? That's what we did last year too, right? It's like, there's four guys that all did their job week in and week out and they all played really well. People are excited about them. That's how you play winning football, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt Stefan Diggs is a diva. He's the epitome of a diva when you think of wide receiver. He just is. Uh, but it's one year and that's the honeymoon period. Everybody, Everybody's happy-go-lucky and, and excited for one year, except Antonio Brown. It's the only one that doesn't work out. Antonio Brown goes to the Raiders. You don't have a year honeymoon there. Uh, every Everyone else, even if it's Terrell Owens, right, one year, you're, everything is is peachy. And that's all they're that's all they're going for is just this one year over there in Houston. So uh, I, I think those concerns are alleviated given the sort of the honeymoon period that comes about. And yeah, I'm I'm not too concerned about that because I don't I don't believe it's a long term arrangement or marriage anyway. I think Houston's going for it. They're taking advantage of Stroud's rookie deal and another beneficiary, especially in all 22, Joe Mixon. He finally, I mean, even before this move, finally at least got to run gets to run behind a quality or solid offensive line over there in Houston and a good system for, for running backs. And now he gets another weapon that really has to take the attention of the defense. This is phenomenal for me. This is another player that probably only has one year left that you're really looking to sap some production out of him. And the situation just got even better for him. So uh, two main beneficiaries from this move for sure, Joe Mixon and, and of course, Stefan Diggs in my opinion, but um, yeah, Joe Mixon, another one. A lot of people, you know, a lot of owners in this leagues or in these leagues are trying to work around the margins when it comes to running backs. I think Joe Mixon is a very high ceiling for 2024. Okay. And I, I mean, this is totally unrelated, but I'm just going to talk about it for a second. I think this conversation is what makes Jamar Chase so special because like so far in his young career, and it is still a young career, he never talks about needing the ball. <laughs> he talks about winning, right? And like for him to be that level of receiver, to have that kind of attitude, I think is what makes him super special. Totally unrelated. Just needed to give him some flowers. Yeah, he told Joe Burrow to take extra time to get mm -hmm. healthy and recover from his before he was out for the year. He told him, take as much time as you need. We'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That's not him thinking about himself at all. He wants Burrow out there. And, you know, a normal wide receiver would want Joe Burrow out there, get the more targets, get, you know, push the ball downfield, all that. He's like, no, no, take your time, get yourself right for the collective us to be better. So, yeah. I agree. Love, Even when love T Higgins has a big game, when T Higgins has a big game, he's like, that's awesome. Like, that's what we need. We need everybody eating out here. Like it, it, it's winning culture. Right. And I, that's important. And it's, I think in today's NFL, part of the reason all 22 needs to be successful so that like receivers are, and running backs aren't the only ones getting all like the smoke because everybody else needs the spotlight and offensive linemen need the spotlight. Hopefully that happens. Right. Okay. Let's get into our draft analysis for today, which is the edge position. This is overall, in my opinion, just talking at a high level, a very good group of edge rushers. It's a very deep group. It lacks elite talent in it, but it has a lot of guys that I would be very, very comfortable taking in the early to mid first and after. So really good group of talent. And it's also like a pretty diverse group. Like there's a lot of different kind of uh, play styles and talents out there. And I think today we're starting with Dallas Turner, who I'm going to talk about. Dallas Turner, for those that don't know, is an edge rusher out of Alabama. He's 21 years old. He's 6'3", 247 pounds. So the height is good, but maybe slightly lighter than your ideal weight at edge. Uh, 34 and 3 8 inch arms, 1,600 snaps played, 69.8 run defensive grade, 89.3 pass rush grade, 25 career sacks, 67 hurries, 72 stops. Um, I haven't been doing combine stuff, but I have it in here for the edge position, 4, 4, 6, 40 time, and a 40.5 vertical jump. So what we're talking about here with Turner is an elite athlete with decent size uh, and playing for one of the best systems in football. Um, 
just getting to my note of the film here, if you give me one second. This is a guy, right? Like I, I said, the athleticism is awesome. I think he probably has the best bend out of the group of edge players we're talking about today. Um, the, the arm length is incredible. He kind of looks like that like that power forward in the NFL with these really long arms who might be like undersized for the power forward position, but like the arms are just so long that like he gets away with it and he's strong enough to get away with it. It's kind of guy he is. And I think that he has really good movement skills, but his arsenal of total uh, moves is slightly limited. So let's get into it. This first play here shows some of that skill against the run. He uses his long arm on the inside. That's him on the bottom of your screen there. Number 15. He uses that long arm, right? You see that he separates from the tackle, keeps him away from his frame and doesn't get pushed back. So you're going to see from this angle, watch him just separate, hold his ground, keep the outside and then just fight back to the inside to make the play on the running back. It's a very small gain. I'll take that every day for my edge. Second play, he's lined up over the tight end, which is Brock Bowers, who is, again, you know, people talking about him as a top 10 prospect. There's a lot of shuffling going on on this play. There he is, number 15, celebrating. Pause it here for a second. Let's just talk about it. So he's lined up outside of Bowers here, number 19. So that's him on the outside. Um, again, a lot of shuffling is going to go on on this play. So just let me talk about it before we really run it. He fights off a block. There's going to be a receiver that comes down on him. He fights through that and is able to help with this tackle. Um, and there's a pulling tackle coming out him as well. So again, a lot of muck. You're going to watch him here. Watch the receiver come down. Watch him get over that. And then watch him fight off a pulling tackle. Okay. Go ahead and hit play. So snap. Gets off that. Gets off the tackle. Helps make this tackle. To take on two blocks like that, that weren't even the guys lined up across from you. It's pretty awesome. That's the kind of athlete he is. He's a very, very good athlete for the position of edge rusher. This next play, play number three here, he's lined up as an edge. Pause it here. He's lined up as an edge outside of the tackle at the top of your screen. Uh, he uses his real just pure strength on this. Like when you talk about a player that needs a little bit of momentum, right? I said he's slightly undersized, slightly like not a super heavy guy. Sometimes you can use that athleticism to help build up this explosiveness, right? He does that here. And he basically pushes the tackle into the quarterback and gets a sack. It's a it's a pretty awesome play. Go ahead and hit, hit play. We'll talk about it. Watch him just drive that tackle all the way back into the quarterback. Get the sack. Pause it here for a second. So he's on the right side of your screen here, 15. He's not that number two that's playing linebacker. He's outside of that. So go ahead and hit play. Watch him just blow this guy backwards, right? When when you're that fast and that strong and that explosive, that's the kind of thing that you can do. Really cool play there. Just again, uses just pure bull rush and uses that kind of stiff arm to keep that that uh, that distance between him and the tackle to blow him back. Pretty cool. Let's get to the, the last play um, here. And Ray always kind of talks about trends, right? Like what we're doing when we're showing you this tape, it's showing you trends. When Turner gets that build-up screen uh, speed that I just showed you, He's able to be explosive enough, strong enough, fast enough to do basically anything he wants. But what happens when he doesn't have that time to build up that speed? That's kind of what happens here. On this play, the tackle, I think he's on the left here again, over uh, 71. The tackle gets his hand on him early. And what most edge players do when they're at that elite level is they use another move, right? Maybe they use um, like a... Uh, a Euro step, maybe they use a spin move to get back inside to kind of knock the tackle off balance. Turner, to me, that's what separates him from that really elite group of, of edge rushers we've seen in recent years. Go ahead and hit play. He, he, he basically, again, just tries to use that strength, but you lost, right? So like you need to do something else. You need to counter. You need to try, try something else. He, he's trying to rip. I get that. But like, that's, that's a, that's a speed move, right? Like I need you to do something else. I need you to use some lateral movement here. Fight back inside. Fight to get back to you know the 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 quarterback's inside hip. He just doesn't do that. He gets washed out of the play. And I think that there was an opportunity here for him to make a nice play. But again, Turner is that really great athlete for me. He's probably edge one of this class. But maybe we save some of that conversation for the end. What do you think of Turner? Yeah, everything is there but it doesn't always all come together. And maybe you, maybe you agree with this. I haven't seen him in many top 10 mock drafts or in the top 10 of many mock drafts here for 2024. And it makes sense because he's not, 
he's not at that level. And so that's a bit rare for, for edge rushers to not be in the top 10, to not have the top edge rusher in the top 10 of a class. Uh, we're, we've become accustomed to seeing at least one of these freak guys make it in, in, in the top 10. I don't see Turner at that level when comparing to recent years. Now, if I'm comparing him to Tyree Wilson, who I think last year did go in the top 10, right? I mean, I would take Turner all day over just a guy who's there because he has really long arms and finally became productive when he was 23 years old in college. Um, but yeah, the, the parts are all there. The tools are all there, but they haven't yet all come together or they don't consistently all come together, right? It's that, it's that plan that you have to have as a rusher. And when that plan gets blown up, are you savvy enough to have this innate feel for whatever counter is available to you at that time, right? Whether it's a hard sell outside and then you can work back inside to take advantage of an overset by the tackle or whatever the case is. I don't see that that often. I see his plan and he's just trying to execute it. Even if it's not there at first blush, he's just going to try to out athlete out uh, physical ability you to the quarterback. And I think that's, a, that doesn't work in the NFL, but B, that's what kept him even in college of, of reaching the level of some of the great, you know, prototype pass rushers that we have seen gone in the top five, top eight in recent years of the NFL draft. So, um, very good player, very, uh, very, uh, very high ceiling and not necessarily a low floor. I think no matter what, he's going to be productive because he is good enough even today at what he does to be very effective in the league. But if you're talking edge one, you want to see him be a perennial, again, true pro bowler, not alternate, you know, eighth alternate type to just show up and play dodgeball. Uh, you want to see him at that level. And to get there, which he can, he has to work on those other finer points of his game. Okay. I'm going to save some of those takes for when we do like the audio part of this episode, just because there's a lot to unpack there. There's a, there's a whole conversation mm -hmm. we need to have. So Let's jump to the second guy. I think I saw it was Liatu Latu out of LSU or UCLA, excuse me. Is that correct? UCLA, yep. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So 23 year old so, prospect, yeah, 23 year old prospect, 6'5, 259 pounds. He has 32 and 5 eighth inch arms, played 1,200 snaps, 82.1 run defensive grade, an elite, an absolute elite 94.3 pass rush grade, had 29 career sacks, 86 hurry, 65 stops. A 4.64, 40 time, 32 inch vert, 9.8 broad, and did not do anything else. So, again, highly, highly productive player out of UCLA. Tell me about him. Yeah, this is this is a player. You he's a complete player. It's going to be funny when I roll the first play after I just said that, but um, he's a complete player who who can help you out in any way you need. You can put him in any system, and he will be effective. He can line up obviously on the edge and win either around the corner or with a counter move back inside. You can line him up on the inside as an inside rusher in B gap and he'll do just fine there and generate pressure. He does a really good job of, of just slipping, slithering through contact. He does not stay engaged with blockers very long at all. He just has that ability to just slip by you. It's almost like he's covered in Vaseline when you're trying to, when you're trying to block him and he, you just can't get a good, good hold of him. You just, you just can't. It's this innate ability that, that is really fun to see uh, and watch. So, I mean, you mentioned 23 years old. We'll talk about that in some more detail later, but you see it on tape. This is an experienced player, a nuanced player who does have also some athleticism and and uh, bendability and some natural leverage too that we'll get to. So I'm going to go ahead and run it here because of course I wanted to watch him against Oregon State and Talisi Fuaga uh, and the likes there, right? I wanted to see a real battle. And so the first play, we're going to talk about, you know, again, one thing that could be worked on, I think, if that's the correct play here. Um, so again, lined up at edge. I mean, this is Fuaga being Fuaga, but again, he gets squared up on here. You see him use the long arm here to try to get that separation. He's going to try. Yes, he's setting the edge, and he's going to try to work back inside, but Fuaga is just a beast, and you see by the time he he rips under, I mean, the play's, the play's well beyond him. But that's, again, you're talking edge rusher head up on a 330-pound, just powerful mammoth offensive tackle who's going to go in the top 15 of the draft. So that's going to happen. Uh, but that's not a trend that you see too often. I wanted to show it just because 
I feel like people would talk about it, right? We might have even shown this play for Fuaga a few episodes back. I'm not sure because we you know, saw this game too because, again, it's two top talents going at it. So just want to throw that out there. Uh, but then you see him again. This might be the next player, at least the next pass rush in the game here. Again, lined up uh, out on the edge here. And you're going to see him turn the corner quickly and just use his hands. I mean, the ball is out immediately. But look at everyone else and look at Latu already. He's got this, this nice body lean and he is right now, he is parallel just on a straight path to the quarterback. If this ball isn't out as quick as it is, I mean, that's a, that's an, that's an easy sack, a quick win. So again, just run it back in full speed. Just watch how quickly he gets around the edge and how quickly the ball is just out of there. So again, that doesn't show up as a sack on the stat sheet or anything, but that is a very quick win on the edge against a premier offensive tackle. Here he is again on the edge. I want you to pay attention before the snap. Probably missed it. You're going to see a call out here. So, A, this whole UCLA defense is well coached. I think they had DeAnton Lynn as their coordinator before. before. Uh, but they call out a motion and doesn't fall at all for the play action fake here. It's going to be a screen to, uh, to the field side here. And watch how he just boxes out the blocker. He does not give up his positioning at all so he there's nobody between him and the ball carrier and he can go ahead and make the tackle that's that's veteran stuff so again watch he you know just hip to hip does not let the let the uh let the blocker here get between him and the ball carrier boxes him out and then uses just look at that ankle flexion that body lean you see it over and over again with him just the the fluidity that he plays with and then just goes ahead and makes a tackle. So sniffs out the screen, uses his body perfectly, and then goes ahead to to finish the playoff here. Not sure why the uh, the, the angle's a little weird here, but again, you're going to see, again, where I talked about how he doesn't get squared up on often. Again, just uses his hand, just have this guy grasping at air uh, when, he go, when he tries to cross face and then puts himself on a path to the ball carrier, makes a play. It's just that easy for him. It just... He makes it look so easy that it doesn't wow you, but that's an incredible play. Someone coming across formation and he just swipes at him and frees his body up and you you don't get any contact on him. He makes a play in the backfield. Then they move him uh, to get a mismatch here. So this is what you see with Leatu Latu when he's not going against a first round offensive tackle is just, just please. Again, balls out again immediately, but uses his hand here. Tackle actually did a decent job of flashing hands and pulling back to try to get him off balance, but the natural balance of lot two is just phenomenal. And so again, just kind of swipes through and has a path to the quarterback, but the ball's out immediately. And then yet again, you're not a first round offensive tackle, so you're not going to stop me. This time the ball is not out in less than two seconds and it's an easy sack. So I, I forgot I had another play in here, but yeah, here we go. Here's lot two, I guess, lined up on the inside. I forget what happens here, but I'm going to assume I put this in here because you're going to see him not get squared up on and easily slip through some contact. Let's see. Okay. Yep. Swipe through again. So he actually uh, paused here. Yep. Actually controlled the action the entire way. Is it a run? Okay. No, it's not play action. Now he's going to rip through Should and have been a hold. go on a path to the quarterback. Of, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Should mm -hmm. have been a hold, but even, even so you notice, even when it's holding, he slips through, he does not stay engaged with the blocker. It's, uh, it, it's like he's covered in Vaseline. I don't know how else to describe his game. I don't know if that's going to be like a like a YouTube flag or something because it it, it sounds weird. But that's that's Latu's game. He's got great body lean. He doesn't stay hooked on contact very long at all. He's just always pushing forward and using his body well to just get consistent pressure to the ball carrier or the quarterback, whether in run or pass from the edge or from the inside. He's a complete player. I agree. It, I need, yeah, I, I was actually, I was gonna say, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. It, he's interesting to me. Like he's obviously an older prospect. So you see that maturity to his game. I think if you saw a spider chart of like how he does in each area of his game, everything would be at like 80%. Like, I think my issue with Latu is he was, you know, he went to the combine. He was almost 260 pounds. I don't know if you noticed this, but looking at him in film, he looks like he's 230 pounds. Like he just mm -hmm. does not look nearly that big. And I don't know if he really plays that big. So like, I'm, I'm not sure if there's something missing there. Um, I think that he has a really nice arsenal of moves with his pass rush. 
I don't think, again, I don't think any of them are elite pass moves. I don't think he has elite talents in his pass rush game. He's just so solid and so consistent that it doesn't really matter all that much. I think it matters in the fact that like every team wants a Nick Bosa, a Miles Garrett, and a Max Crosby and those guys, but a lot like a, a Liatu Latu is the guy that's going to be just there every day, week in, week out, playing at a high level. You never have to worry about him. He's going to be on your team for 10 years, and he's just going to be a good football player. But I don't know if he ever is all pro edge. Um, so I, that's that's my only knock. That's really my only knock on him. I like well, you him. hope he's on your team for 10 years. We the, the the medicals are an issue with him, right? He's got he's got mm-hmm. an extensive injury history. So if he holds up that long, yeah, he's gonna be he's gonna be a very productive player. But that's not information we're privy to. We just know that there's some injury history there, and that's what could cause him to slide. Right. Okay. Agreed. We'll talk about the rankings and stuff later. Yep. Who do we so, have next? Your boy. I, which one? Trice. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let me pull up my notes on Trice. Braylon Trice played for Washington on that, you know, really good Washington team from this past year that made it to the college championship. He's also a 23 year old prospect, 6'3, 245 pounds, 32 and a half inch arms, played 1,700 snaps with a 72.1 run defensive grade, 90.8 pass rush, 19 career sacks, 108 hurries, 52 stops, 47240, didn't do anything else. This is a guy that when I watched his highlight tape, I was very, very excited at what I saw. I thought there was fantastic per- pursuit skills. He was kind of that, again, like sideline to sideline player at edge, which is really rare, kind of strange, right? Um, he obviously has significant playing time and production, and he plays the run extremely well for, for an edge player that's under 250 pounds. Obviously, he's an older prospect. He's slightly undersized. But my biggest knock on him after watching in-depth film on, you know, every, you know, every play of every game, it's this guy needs to control his his body just better in general. Like he has to do a better job controlling his frame. I I purposely chose this USC film because he's playing against Caleb Williams, the guy that's gonna exuberate that, right? He's gonna make he's gonna show this more than any other quarterback would. On this play, he's lined outside of the the tackle, uh, and he shows that he has counter moves, right? Like, again, he's an older prospect. He's 23 years old. He has a nice arsenal of moves. If he doesn't win right away, I was knocking Dallas Turner for that before. Dallas Turner, if he doesn't win right away, that's kind of it. Braylon Trice has secondary moves, and I really like that to his game. He's going to fight. He's going to get his hands. uh, He's going to get outside. He's going to get a little bit too deep. And he's going to counter. He's going to win with a spin move. Love it. But Caleb Williams is Caleb Williams, and he's going to move away from Trice. And just, again, he's going to play out of control. So go ahead and hit play. Let's just watch it together. That's him on the bottom. He's losing, but he counters with a spin. And he's basically there, right? He's. But what does he do there, right? Why did he lose outside leverage? As an edge player, your job is you do not lose the edge, right? And that's what, he, what happens on that play. Um, it's a little frustrating for me there. Just again, like this is a clear sack. You're you're a borderline first round pick. People are talking about you and you just lose the edge like that. You should be bringing him back to your defensive interior players, trusting your teammates. He doesn't do that there. He loses. He loses on the play. Yeah, he had him, he had him dead to rights. That's that's being the, the tackle being directly behind you. Is mm-hmm. is a position you always want to take a ten out of ten times, and Caleb Williams just did Caleb Williams things. So, and yeah. I I showed that play because, like you always say, Ray, we should be th- showing reoccurring themes. Right here, he's lined up on the bottom, right over the left tackle. He gets a quick move to get off of that tackle, swims under him. There's a tight end trying to help out. Go ahead and hit play. Let's just do it. By the way, I think you could hit play on this on this segment oh, too. By here. the way, yeah, see, I totally can. Let's get it. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. He was on the top of your screen. He wasn't on the bottom. I don't know how to re- rewind though. I don't know if I can do that like you can. Yeah, you got it. Okay, you, so you he, can. You just got to hit the hit the scroll. See, but right. you got to get it just right. Otherwise, you look like this. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> so he's on the top of your screen. I was wrong. Apologies on that. He's on the top of your screen. Watch him beat the tackle with that. Gets under the tight end too. Again, has Caleb Williams dead and just misses, right? This this is going to be a problem come draft day because teams are going to go, is he strong enough, right? I said he's not 250 pounds. If you have Caleb Williams, who is a very small quarterback, 
compared to the Josh Allens of the world, and you have him by the shoulder pads with both hands on him, you should be tossing him to the ground like a rag doll. Obviously, that did not happen. Okay. Braylon Trice on this play, again, lined up over tackle. He's going to stunt inside under the around the defensive interior and does a really great job getting past the guard, slipping past him on this play. Um, but let's just watch. Let's see what happens, right? Gets under, out of control. Again, out of control, right? This is Caleb Williams. I get it. Caleb Williams is the king of that. But you are a borderline first-round pick. You have hands on the quarterback again. Caleb Williams, by the way, completes this pass and gets a really nice gain. I just, I just don't know what was happening. Apologies. That was a different play. So let's get back to it. I'm going to pause it now. Okay. Play three, play four. Nice job here against the run. He's lined up over the left tackle again on the outside over 79. Uh, keeps outside on free, holds his ground, funnels it inside, does his job. I talk about an edge needing to be an edge player, right? The point of that is you keep outside leverage, but when you're playing the run, the way you do that best is you close the gap between the tackle and the guard, right? You should be pushing the tackle back inside so that that space in between the guard and the tackle collapses and you keep the outside leverage so that if it does funnel back outside, you have the ability to get it back to the inside. That's what he does here. Let's watch it. He steps up, right? Look at that right there. Great extension with the left arm. He's basically just shoving that tackle's face to nowhere and he's keeping that right arm free so that the running back here, right? He's saying the running back actually has decent hold. The defensive lineman, uh, that 70s blocking is just, he's going to lose 52 is about to kill the, the linebacker. So there is a nice hole to go to, but Braylon Trace does his job hundred percent on this funnels it inside. And uh, yeah, d just does a really nice job on that. Uh, everybody else kind of didn't, didn't. Now he's lined up over the right tackle here outside over 52. He's really far outside on this one. Uses a really great Euro step to beat the tackle inside. Again, he has a lot of moves. I love that about this guy's game. Watch number six on this, the running back, right? So Trice beats him with the Euro. Number six flattens him. He's playing out of control. He needs to get his frame under him. He needs to do a better job of finishing his plays. You can't just win with the move because in today's NFL, that running back's going to be 230 pounds and he's really going to bury you, right? So just a just another, another knock, another example of Braylon Trice just not playing under control. Then the last play here, oh, did I, nope, okay. So here he is, oh my God. I right. got you, I got you, just read the note. <laughs> I keep, oh, uh, you played it. <laughs> you, you got it, you got it. Last play here, Trice is lined up over the left tackle and uses a nice quick move to beat the tackle inside, fights through pressure and beats a helping guard, making a nice tackle on the running back. So here he is, he's actually playing as if he's, really like more close to the line of scrimmage compared to the other plays we saw. Go ahead and hit play. He's going to beat this tackle on the right side, get under guard, tries to help slips under makes a really nice tackle in the backfield. Finally, I wanted to end on a play where he finished. This is a good example of that beats two blocks, finishes the play in the backfield. Nice play by Breland Trice. I'm scared of Breland Trice. I'm very scared of Breland Trice. I'm not sure. Should I save the name that I have in my head? For yes. the audio portion, save it for yeah. the audio. I'll just say it's worrisome when you can't finish plays like that because it tells me that in order to win, you have to sacrifice your your control, your technique, in a sense that you have to get out over your skis in order to win, mm -hmm. and it, that just doesn't work, right? You if you can't win with with having your hands, you know, f within your frame and your body under control so that you can, you can have a combo of moves. You can transition from, from one move to the next. You can transition from pass rush to square up to tackle. If you can't do that, you're not going to last long. And that, and that tells me that something is, something is not there and you are almost like overexerting yourself to get to point B but you never get to the point where you can finish point C. It's 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 a concern that comes up a lot on tape. So I'll save my name and just say you see a lot of maybe pass rush wins. His pass rush win rate is probably pretty good, but if he can't finish, I'm not sure he's going to last very long. So 
Uh, I got some concerns. The upside is there because if he could just finish, it'd be great. But why can't you if you're 23 years old and and you're probably the oldest guy on your defense? Maybe not a Washington for that matter, but but you're a more experienced player than what you're going up against 90% of the time. That's the type of stuff that should be coming naturally to you at this stage. And if it's not yet, then I don't know if it ever will when you're in the NFL. Yeah, that's good points. And we'll talk about it later. Next guy is Jared Verse from Florida State, another older prospect at 23 years old, 6'4", 254 pounds, 33 and a half inch arms, played 1,700 career snaps, 65.3 run defensive grade, but a 90.8 pass rush grade, 31 career sacks, 86 hurries, 89 stops, ran a 4.58 40 yard dash, 35 inch vert, 10, uh, 10 7 broad, 31 reps on bench press, 7'3", three, 3 three cone, and a 4'4", four, 4 four shuttle. Very good athlete. I want to see some film on him. Yeah, when you when you say what you see is what you get, normally it's a good thing, and we'll talk about it a bit more with Jared Verse, but Jared Verse is what you see is what you get. He lets you know who he is and just shows you over and over and over again, right? So we're going to start here uh, at the goal line against LSU. I mean, there's there's an arrow pointing out of you. see him. He's at the end. Uh, he's the man on the line of scrimmage there. Uh, looks like they might have an, an extra tackle to the left side there. Uh, but again, just this is just man ball. This is goal. This is goal to go from inside the two. Uh, man ball, except for the fact that I was using shotgun because why? That's just whatever. Um, but anyway, so you're just going to see him here line up, just knock back the tackle here. Uh, I think this is number 66. I mean, look look at his base. He's he's straight up here, just pointing to the sky. He has no leverage. Verse just gets under him and just pushes him straight back mucks up everything and it's a stop at the goal line. So you're going to see it from this angle here again, lined up to the inside shoulder of uh, the end man here on the left, number 66. And he's just going to just push him straight back. And when that pile just piles up, there's nowhere for the runner to go because verse is there. He drove his man straight back and it's a stop. I believe this is the very next play again. Now he's lined up on the right side inside of the tackle on the right side of your screen here. And so from the inside, he's going to go ahead and now he's just going to bully a guard. He's just going to say, okay, whoever you put in front of me, I'm just going to dog walk them back to the quarterback. That's just, that's just what he is. That's Jared verse. He's just going to man ball you. So uh, we're going to see him now here again, lined up uh, over left tackle and here I wanted to show just a little bit and where he tries to not man ball you and he still wins. I mean, look at the tackle here. I mean, this that's, that's, that's not PG rated right there, but um, he's not necessarily pressuring the quarterback. He wins against the man in front of him, but he doesn't necessarily distress Jaden Daniels by any stretch and the ball is out pretty quickly, but even so there's not a clear path to the quarterback here. We saw with lots who, the quick win and the ability to kind of uh, bend the corner and use your body lean to just have a straight path to the QB verse beat the hell out of this guy, but there's no straight path to the QB just quite yet. And so that's, that's a common theme you see. He's a prototypical power rusher. So yet again, there was a lot of time spent on the goal line for the Florida state defense for a team that won by quite a bit in this game. They spent a lot of time at the goal line. Um, so again, he's lined up over left tackle uh, number five here and yet again, just bullying straight back, just mucking everything up and going ahead and contributing to the eventual stop there. So that's just, he's just, you're going to end up sore when you go up against your adverse. The next day, you are going to be incredibly sore. You might not end up on a poster, but you're going to be incredibly sore. So here we have him as a rusher at uh, over the right tackle here. And you're just going to see again, he it's not a bad rush by any means. It's a great rush. It's a quick win because you see he gets to the outside shoulder as I run it back here of the tackle and kind of uses his strength to pressure Jaden Daniels and disrupt his timing. But it's not that it's not that clean path. He's kind of getting pushed by a little bit. He's off balance. He's going to make contact and, again, kind of knock him back a little bit. But he doesn't get himself free. He doesn't work himself free when it's not a straight uh, power rush. And I think that's the one part of his game that you want to see uh, more of in, in just strict pass rushing situations. I think this is the same play from a different angle here. So uh, boom, 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 good, good extension, good leverage, good lean, right? He's got a good base and kind of rips through. And that's great. He, he you could see he kind of disrupts, you know, he's, he's agitating Daniels a little bit, but 
he doesn't free himself up. I think this is a, if, if I remember correctly, this is towards the end of the game. They're up like 17 points and uh, it's just straight passing situations. And so he was going to line up over the left tackle again, straight pass rush. He's going to use a long arm and he's going to win. He's going to make the quarterback step up in the pocket, but he's able to get back to the line of scrimmage for no gain because verse can't quite disengage. So the long arm is great. He's walking the tackle back and then he works his way back to the QB who steps up. But it's it's no gain. It's not a quick sack. It's not a it's not a quick win in a sack in a in a must have passing down situation. That's that one bit of his game that that is just missing because otherwise, I mean, you're in for a fight when you're going up against Jared Verse. He's your prototypical power rushing strong side edge player, and and he leaves no bones about it. Everything you think of when you think of that prototype of player, that profile, that's what Jared Verse brings to the table. Verse wins with speed. He wins with strength. He wins with technique. He has ideal size. He's a high effort player. I I don't really have a lot that I didn't like about him. There was a, there was just so much to like. And if you watch that one play uh, that you were showing, where you know he comes off the edge, and yeah, he didn't he didn't disengage in time. But if you watch his get off compared to everybody oh, yeah, else on the line of scrimmage, he's three yards past everybody else. Like it's it's absurd, right? Like. He's he's so talented, and just for those that don't know, there were teams last year talking about him being the first edge of that class. So this is a guy that has been highly regarded by the draft community for multiple years. Um, I think teams like him more than the draft community does. I think people are talking about him as a really good player. I think the NFL thinks that this is a very very good player. I would be I wouldn't be surprised if he goes a lot earlier than the consensus assumes that he will. My only, I guess, knock on him is I don't think he has elite twitch, right? Like when you watch Dallas Turner and versus film side by side, Turner is so twitchy. It's absurd. He fights through three blockers to make a play and he's so high effort that he just makes that stuff look easy. Verse, like you said, is more power. He's a bigger guy, but he just, he might be like a better pure edge rusher than Turner is. So it's going to be a really interesting oh, yeah, conversation. I would agree with that. Yeah, it'll be an interesting conversation. Especially today. Especially today. Maybe in three years, maybe not. I think today. Yeah. Right. And and then that, you know, 23 versus 21 year old. So that I mean, that does matter. But we'll get into that conversation later. Last guy we're talking about today is Chop Robinson from Penn State, 21 years old, 6'3, 254 pounds, 33 and a half inch arms, played a thousand snaps, 76.3 run defensive grade, 92.3 pass rush grade, 10 career sacks, 61 hurries, 33 six stops we're in a four four eight with a 34.5 inch vert 10 eight broad uh four two five shuttle so this is a really really high-end athlete for the edge position and i think he has a lot of the same strengths as a dallas turner with a little less twitch he wins with his buildup right he needs a little bit of that buildup to get his speed and strength up to par to win consistently um and he uses a really good uh, strip hand, has great bend, but he really relies on the speed moves uh, and loses gap integrity sometimes with his over pursuit. And he can honestly, he could be caught guessing sometimes, but let's show some film. Uh, this first play, I believe he's lined up on the outside. He's got his hand in the dirt there at the bottom of your screen. He builds up some explosiveness. He has time to build up that speed like I'm talking about, which really helps him here and is able to push the guy back into the quarterback. Before you hit play, everybody just take a look right here. Mm -hmm. False start, left tackle, Ohio State. Just throwing it out there, not called. <laughs> just, I'm just saying, just look at it. <laughs> they don't call. I feel like the the league and the, the college, I guess, too. No, they they don't. Just don't call it anymore. It's bizarre. <laughs> no. But okay, just let's throw it out there. Let's watch some football. Here he goes. Just literally, again, when he has that space, he, he was lined up pretty wide. When he has that space and can build up that speed, he builds up strength too and explosiveness and just drives the tackle back. And this is Ohio State. These are elite tackles, right? He drives this dude back into the quarterback like he's on roller skates, right? That's the kind of power and athleticism that Chop has. Great play in my mind. Um, but watch this one here. He already looks off balance right like the guys in motion i think he was expecting the snap to come and again he's kind of caught guessing here he's off balance he uh he kind of is able to recover 
the guard comes and essentially like chop recovers again. He, he recovers his form. He's not off balance anymore, but he didn't have that buildup speed. So he didn't have the strength that he had on the previous play and watch him essentially just get buried, right? Pancaked. Uh, that can't happen, right? Like when you're a big, strong, fast edge player, you just can't get buried by a pulling guard. That that one bothered me a little bit. And I think, again, he relies on that speed a little bit too much on pass rush, and he doesn't have so many moves where he can do other things. And in my opinion, sometimes that leads to wasted reps. This is one of those plays where he should have maybe used a lateral step inside to, to uh, win, but he just ends up getting super deep. Like, you're not doing anything for me when you're seven, eight yards downfield, right? Like, that's just... That's just nonsense. Like the tackle basically didn't have to do much. You just ran yourself out of the play. Like it, to me, that's unfortunate because there was something to do on that play where he could have made an impact and he just didn't. And then this last play here that I'm going to uh, show you, is just a nice one against the run. He's lined up head on to the tackle, gets down blocked by the tight end. This is, uh, I believe, uh, what's his name? Ohio State tight end here. Stover. Yeah, Kate Stover. I almost said Kate Oten, and that's why I kind of held my breath. Stover. Comes down on Chop, and Chop just does a really great job keeping his arm free. I talked about that before with with um, with Verse. You got to keep that arm free as an edge rusher, and he does that, and he, he contributes to the tackle. And uh, I want to see it from the other angle. Did I get it? Yeah. So we get to see it from this angle a little bit better. He's blocking down. He does a great job just keeping that guy off of him. Just drives to the play, makes a great tackle. So. From my perspective, I, I really do like Chop. I think he's a good football player. I think we'll get to the rankings later, but there are things about his game that leave me wanting more, and I know that physically he's able to do it. So I don't know what to do with that. He is 21 years old. I think I would be willing to take that risk. It's just really a matter of when. I believe he just turned 21 years old, too. I think this is a very young prospect. The other thing to note with Chop is he only played – defensive end full-time for two years. He was at linebacker his first year at Maryland. He was not a, a defensive end until he went to Penn State and became a, a an edge rusher uh, full-time in 2022 and then obviously in 2023 yet again. So he is very new to the position. So he is working off of basically his base athleticism, that first step, his speed, and then what he can convert to power from there. He doesn't have an array of moves because he's raw. I mean, he's, he's just young young normally and then young for the position uh as well and so yeah it's like what what do you do with that i guess we'll talk about that more in in the in, in the next segment here coming up uh other than obviously he's he's a great high character no in all seriousness i think he is a great high character kid a lot of people rave about him uh around the program he had a really positive effect on the defensive line room at penn state despite coming in as a transfer after one year so um you definitely have high marks on the intangible side of the fence for Chop Robinson. So we'll get into more when we talk about everybody here and sum it all up. Yeah. And with that, let's welcome in audio only people. Thank you for tuning in today to the All 22 podcast. If you didn't see, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you can go to YouTube and see that Ray and I basically broke down the film of what we believe are some of the top edge rushers in this draft class. Now we are going to go into rankings, maybe some comps, maybe some team fits and things like that. And I want to start with really the first, right? Let's talk about who we have at the top of this class. I think I already kind of blew my cover on this saying that I do think the top is Dallas Turner um, out of Alabama, again, 21 years old. He is this freak athlete that I think a lot of teams are coveting. And I think that that twitch, that athleticism, you might be able to do more than what they did at Alabama. He's only 247 pounds, right? Jack Campbell last year, middle linebacker, was heavier than Dallas Turner is. I think because of that, because of the athleticism that Turner has, there's a chance that you can move him around your defense a little bit. Maybe he could even drop in coverage sometimes. I know he did that a little bit in college. So I like that for them. I like that for him. But it does mean that the right team needs to pick him with that need in mind, right? If you don't need a guy that has to have his hand in the dirt, playing and play out, because that's not going to be your guy in Dallas Turner. I like him a lot. I know before you were talking specifically about how maybe he isn't a top 10 pick. Um, I would like, I, I would in this draft too, I would say, I think he deserves that because of that twitch, that athleticism, that age. I think he is a guy that I would invest in, in the top 10. I know a lot of people are saying eight for Atlanta makes a lot of sense. I agree with that. Um, 
and it's really going to come down to like, I don't want to do it this episode, but I think we will have an episode where we're just going to do our big board. Right. And we could say, why is he in your top 10 when there are so many good tackles, receivers, quarterbacks in this, in this draft? Like, is he better than some of those guys? And for me, the answer is yes. I think that, I think that I would take him over some of those guys. So for me, again, top 10 pick for Dallas Turner. I don't really have a great, great comp for him. I don't know if you have one. I think that, you know, like, there are things you see with his teammate Will Anderson from last year. There is th- there are things to his game where he emulates. You can tell, right? It's the same system. It's Alabama. He does things a little similarly. I like that about his game, and I do think the Falcons would be a just a perfect fit for him. Um, is he also your edge one? He is, but I wouldn't put money on him. I wouldn't put money on him not being the best edge in the class as far as having like the best career, but. I wouldn't put money on him having the best career despite being the edge one in my rankings because it's not, it's not surefire. Mm -hmm. It's not surefire. There's some rawness there and he hasn't put it all together yet. So I don't even know if that, that whole analogy made sense, but yes, I, 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 he's my edge one, but I wouldn't put money on him having the best career of the edges in the class because yeah, it's just not quite all there. He does have to go into the right system. And this is the kind of player where, Again, organization matters. Situation matters. He's not situation proof because he is young, because he is raw, because he has tools, but doesn't have the polish. He has to go to a good lane. I would like Atlanta for him. I think it's a good, a good fit, a good organization for him. Um, but that it's going to be, it's going to be scheme dependent. He can get lost in the shuffle, and a bad organization can ruin a, a, a promising prospect. This is the type of promising prospect a bad organization could potentially ruin because he's not coming into the league with such polish. So, yeah, got the tools to do anything you you want him to do for the most part. Just got to put it together. So, yeah, he's my edge one. I, I would say he's my edge one as well. As far as like a like a like a player comp, I don't know, man. I mean, at a high level. You could look at at a at a Adafe Owe when it comes to hey you have a bunch of tools but you didn't quite put it all together right but all the athleticism is there I think Owe was a little bit bigger framed than he was um, but that type of situation applies I see some Brian Burns in there too uh, you know that that's a that's a fit as well if you were if you were to kind of squint a little bit so the upside is there in the the high end player comparison as far as the what what he can become you see it. And it's there on Sundays. Just just be consistent. Just put it all together, which part of that comes with natural maturity when you're a young prospect heading into the league. Cool. So lead off the edge two. Okay, so my edge two, be, it's 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 chop. I'm sorry, it's chop. I I am very I am very hard pressed to not put the rusher with the best first step in the class outside of like my top one or two rushers. And I'm sorry, chop has the best first step in this class. It is absolutely tantalizing. Chris shows you the game that he got concussed in and injured against Ohio state. So you couldn't see it, but basically like if if you turn on the Michigan game and just watch the first half, because they don't even attempt to pass in the second half, they attempt one and it officially didn't even count because Kalen King got pass interference. But if, if Michigan had to pass the ball in the second half, their right tackle was going to quit football. It was that bad. Uh, Chop just has the type of first step where if you just were not born with the type of athleticism to keep up with him, there is li- there is absolutely nothing you can do to stop him. It's it's incredible. You put on, like on I- Iowa too. Iowa had a solid offensive line, nice physical, well-coached, tough. Their right tackle just l- was not born to be on the same field as chop Robinson and try to stop him in pass rush. There's just something innate with, with chops first step and the ability that just anybody who wasn't born with the correct genetics, you're you, you lost already, no matter what chop has that tantalizing first step. He has more to put together than even someone like a Dallas Turner. He doesn't have quite the frame, right? The arms aren't quite as long. It's more of a Carl Lawson D four type of frame, but to someone who's again only been playing defensive end for two years, has the best first step in the class, and was on a great defense, the most disruptive player on that defense. So, for as young as he is, he's he's my edge too. He's my edge too. Wow. Okay. I mean, hey, teach his own, but uh, I have him at I have him at five. 
Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. And I knew it. I was going to say, I was actually going to end my, my, my whole statement with he's the type of guy everybody's going to overanalyze and then just look at the 23 year olds be like, no, nah, yeah, no, he's, he's good. If Trap <laughs> Robinson was in college for two more years, what do you think his tape would look like if in 2025, this guy was still in college against these offensive tackles? I'm just saying you got, you have it. to consider that. You got I, to consider I do. That. And I usually do, right? Like I, we have that conversation about JJ McCarthy when I'm like, "Hey, like he's playing with his dad." Like you're you shoot it with JJ McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you just pick and choose, right? <laughs> but for me, Chop has so much talent to be unlocked. But my comp for him is Kayvon Thibodeau, and it's it's that rawness and that like little bit lack of strength that concerns me. And it's weird because Penn State is u- usually not the school where I'm like. Dudes need to be stronger, but like Olu and Chop this year, I'm saying with both of them, they need to be stronger, right? Like they need to play a stronger brand of football because in the NFL, it only gets harder. And I've seen that with Thibodeau where on true pass sets where he has that build up speed, he does a fantastic job, but in run plays, there's plays where he gets driven back like three, four yards off the ball and he loses the edge so easily. Chop has a lot of that to his game too. And it's a concern for me that, you know, like I want guys that are going to play well every play right when you're a guy that's picked in the top 20 top 25 of an NFL draft you need to be on the field for me every single play like Tavondre Sweat might be my only exception where it's like this guy is so special at one thing that like I'm okay with taking him in that range and him not being on the field all four plates chop chop to me I just don't know if he's there yet can he become that a hundred percent thousand percent even like I think all the potential in the world I feel that way about Thibodeau like I still think both of them have a world of potential that can be untapped, needs to go to the right team, right system. Hopefully Chop becomes a Raven, right? Because <laughs> they'll just make him great. Yeah. Um, and I think that could happen. My two is Jared Verse, right? And I know you're going to right 23-year-old, right? What is he going to look like when he's 23? Hopefully he looks like Jared Verse because Jared Verse to me could very well be edge one in this class. He is special in the way that he wins. He, he wins at a high level everything he does. And I do think he has elite traits. His strength and power is an elite trait that there's basically nobody else in this class that can match. And I think the size is just perfect. 6'4", 254, it's just perfect, has good length. Um, And again, the production numbers are just there. I I really like him uh, in this class of deep edge players. I think top 15 pick for me makes makes all the sense in the world. Uh, I think you, you mentioned the Raiders before as a team that drafted... Uh, Ty- Tyree Wilson Tyree last Wilson, year, right. and it was basically just a mega fail, right? And it, he's another guy that has a lot of potential and is going to take time. But a Jared Verse steps into that situation across from Max Crosby and next to um, the defensive interior. They Christian Wilkins, they just, yeah, Christian, Christian Wilkins. Wilkins, like that our boy. would be our boy. That would be an insane front four, right? And let Tyree Wilson learn. But I think Jared Verse would immediately step up and be and be a step up from Tyree Wilson. Yeah, my one, I, I think these three, Turner, Chop, Verse, are the ones that I can look back and say either one of these guys can be edge one. With Verse versus Chop, it becomes a preference for me personally, right? I will take, if you told me there's one elite trait in your pass rusher, you go, okay, what, do you want Do you want strength and power or do you want you know first step quickness? I take the first step quickness every time. Um, that's just a personal preference, right? The translatability of the strength, I'm actually not concerned that he's not going to be an effective power rusher in the league. I think I think Verse is going to be at least a nine sack per year type of power rusher on the strong side who is just a monster in the run game. I I, I think all of that is is clear for Jared Verse. I just worry when it's third and nine, third and eight, late in the fourth quarter, in a must have situation is he, when everyone is locked in, is he going to provide that pass rush that's needed to basically end a game? Right. I'm not sure about that because as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's that bit of twitch that he's missing. He can blow. He, he, he has a good first step where he can uh, get to your outside shoulder. He can overpower you with strengths. He can dog walk you to the quarterback, but that last bit of twitch to just get himself off of that contact and turn the corner to finish. I think that's that last little thing that's missing to where it's like, okay, 
to me, he's just that really good player. Can he be elite? I'm not sure if he can because I don't see that last bit of twitch. And so he's probably more of a sure thing than any of the edge rushers in this class. Uh, Turner, Chop, Trice, whoever else you want to throw out there. But I'm just not, I think he's just missing that one little bit that keeps him from being in contention for edge one for me. Okay. I My comp for him, this is, this is a little crazy one, but I, a little Robert Quinn in there. Quinn? Okay. Yeah, did you see late, that? Late stage Robert Quinn was actually stronger than people gave him credit for. I'm just throwing yeah. that out there. People think he's a speed guy just because he's really bendy and it was cool, but like, yeah, yeah. I think he finished he, at he like 260 pop. pounds. Yeah, like big, yeah. bigger dude. And I think the highest floor of any prospect is my number four, and that's Laiatu Latu. I mm-hmm. think his floor is extremely high. This guy, this guy graded out at an elite level because he was doing things higher than anybody else. And like the array of moves might be the best in the class. I don't think he's elite at anything though. Right. Like I think his ceiling is probably maybe the lowest of anyone in this class, right? Like chops floor and ceiling is probably the biggest ratio. Layatu Latu's is probably the smallest where he's probably is what he is, which is just a really good hard nosed football player. And I think that's really valuable, but at 23 years old with the injury history, it makes it a little bit hard to like, say when I expect this guy to go. I think there are teams that are going to look at him and say, this is a really good football player. I want him in the 20s. And then there are going to be a bunch of teams that are like, the medicals are too scary. There's no way I'm spending a first round pick on that. He He's a second round guy, right? If he's there in the second, I take him. Saying that, I would definitely, me personally, take him anywhere from 20 to 25 and just be really happy with the football player I get. Um, what do you think? I think he ends up late teens mid to mid twenties, that range ish there because yeah. of medicals, uh, which again, we're not privy to, but yeah, I think he's, he's as a player, like I said, complete, safe, effective player that just keeps himself clean and just is a pest, but the medicals are an issue. Is he tapped out as far as his ceiling is concerned? I think so. I don't I don't see him getting much bigger. You mentioned he didn't look as big as he measured in at the combine on tape, which I agree with. So what does he ultimately it was what was he just carrying it well or did he bulk up a bit in the offseason? And then if so, what does that look like as a player, right? Uh those are questions to be answered, and we'll never know because they're not gonna weigh the they don't weigh these guys every year. We're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna know what his true playing weight is when now that he's in the league. Um it's just the medicals and the age that tapped the ceiling for me, but otherwise he's, I, I love his game man. the more you watch him, it's just, it's so fun. The body lean. So yeah, 18 to 25, 26 ish, I think is the right range. I think any lower than that is because of just medical issues, which is just an unfortunate part of the process for, for someone like him. We'll see where ultimately ends up. So, and again, all 22 rookie drafts follow that same exact format, right? I'm I'm probably not taking him in the first. I'm definitely taking him in the first round, right? If I'm in a 12 team league. He's not a top 12 pick for me, but back end of the second round in a 12 team rookie draft, you know, right around that pick 20 to 24 ish, I think is right in line with his range. If you have a need for edge at that spot, it's worth it because I don't think there's many lottery tickets behind him in this class. Because I'm a bit of a gambler with upside to where. I'll pass on a safe player if I like the traits of someone who maybe is more of a top 40, 45, 50 type player, but has tools to be uh, you know, a top 10 type of player at their position. I usually take that gamble. In this draft class, I think outside of the guys we've discussed, there's not many lottery tickets that just have to put it together and they can become Pro Bowl type of rushers. I don't see that outside of these guys we've discussed. So if Latu's the name there, and Chop and Turner and Verse are already gone. There's no upside gamble I'm going to take. I'm just going to take Latu and be fine with it and just hope that you know his body can hold up because if so, he's going to grade out very well because he could be on the field every single down and do what is asked of him and, and be good at it. So he's going to grade very well. It's just how does he hold up? Can he become a game breaker or is his ceiling what it is as just a very good player? Right, and so is he your four? Yeah, yeah, he's my he's my four, and the only reason that's the thing, man. He's my four because I'm factoring in some medical. I could watch, like, I'll watch Jared Verse, and I'll go, ah, he's my edge three, and then I'll watch Lyatsu Lyatsu. I'll be like, no, he's my edge three. It goes back and forth, just depends on who I who I saw last. You should be a politician, right? 
You're just never going to give a real opinion. I love it. That's that's my my opinion is that whoever I watched last is is the one that's edge three. I got you. Is Braylon Trace your edge five? Maybe by default. So I'm going to throw out the name that I was holding earlier on. First, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw. I have a name. So I had a name that I felt really good with, with um with Jared Verse too. He's kind of like Greg Ellis. A little more powerful, but like Greg Ellis. Greg Ellis was a big player mm-hmm. who was an effective rusher. You know, again, had a really good swim move, swim over and kind of got consistent pressure. It was always like an 8, 10, 11 type of sack guy, but was never like the dominant guy. Like he was, you know, he would be across from DeMarcus Ware and he'd be a great number two rusher. That's versus that type of player, big, strong, powerful, athletic, just not that quite last bit of twitch. Um Trice I, is sort of by default my next edge because I don't really love anyone else. But he reminds me a bit, I can't get it out of my head, of Kayla Von Chason to where it's like, okay, you're fast, you're not very big, but you don't finish necessarily too well. You're a bit out of control. And we see where Chase on is now. I actually don't know where Chase on is now. He's like completely fallen off. I think he's on a new team now. He's kind of, he's like a reclamation project. He was a first round pick in mm-hmm. 2020. So I can't get Caleb, Caleb on Chase on out of my head. I'm very scared of Braylon Trice. I, I really am scared of him because I see how he could be good. He's he had, he wins quickly, but then he gets out of control and you're like, well, if we, if we could just get him to finish, is it a balanced thing that he has to work on? Uh, you know, is that it? If we just unlock that part of his game, maybe is that, does he then become a viable, effective starting pass rusher? It's possible. Or is that just innate? He just doesn't have the balance and it's just not something that comes natural to him. And then therefore he, he can't finish. If he can't finish in college, you're not going to finish in the NFL. Um, that's a problem. Most people, if you can't finish in college for the rest of your life, it's, it's going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, I just don't know, but he, he scares me. He scares me a lot. He could be a good starting rusher in the league. You see it, but I don't know if I'm touching it, man. I'm too scared. I'll just, I'll just pivot elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I'll pivot elsewhere. And then in all 22, I'll take my chance on the trade market. See, there were, there were a few edge rushers in last year's class that I felt a very similar way as I do with Trice, which is like, uh, the guy, the saints took, I think he, they took him in the third round out of Notre Dame, Isaiah Foskey. Foskey it's, yeah. it's like, this is a really good football player and a guy I like, but he doesn't have anywhere near the traits of an, that there's a possibility of him becoming an elite player. And if there's not even a possibility of that, I'm not taking him in the first round. And that's kind of where I fell. And I actually have him at six. I like Darius Robinson out of Missouri as my, as my five. And we didn't talk about him today. Uh, but, you know, I'll just say a couple things. Guy out of Missouri, 22 years old, 6'5", 285 pounds, 34 and a half inch arms, 81.4 run blocking grade, 78.4 pass rush grade, 14 career uh, sacks. He ran a 4.95 for 285. Not bad. Uh, this is a guy that's going to play with his with his hand in the dirt. Um, so he's a different type of prospect than most of the ones we watched today. But I think that for 285, he wears his weight as well as anybody I've seen, right? Very long arms, good punch, probably the best punch in this class, great body control, just the total end of the other end of the spectrum, really good body control, very good athleticism, but he's not quick twitch, right? He's a, he's a 285 pound guy. He doesn't have that. And he also just, he relies on his power moves very, very much. Doesn't have a lot of moves in his arsenal, especially speed moves. So if you're okay with your need being, I need a guy that's going to put his hand on the dirt on the outside. This is the guy, right? Little bit Cam Jordan to his game. And I really like that about him. Um, I would take this guy in the first round. I would not take Trice. I would take this guy. And obviously, again, it depends on the scheme that I'm running. But I think this guy's good enough. And at 22 years old, like there's more to unlock in his game. He only has 1,500 snaps to his, to his name. Um, I don't know if you watched him, but he's a guy I really liked. I like him a lot too, but I, 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 I put him as a, as a defensive interior type of guy. I think, yeah. uh, given his size, I just think it, in, it, at edge in the NFL, you need to be a bit more sort of slimmed down to be able to turn the corner like that, uh, at that level. So yeah, I, I think he's a better, he's a better football player than, than Braylon Trice, in my opinion as well. hundred mm-hmm. percent. I just, I'm just not sure he's an edge. So I don't, I don't include him in these rankings. So, okay. um, that's why like to me, Trice is by default, like my next edge there, but 
yeah, Darius Robinson's a heck of a player. I mean, you nailed him. And yeah, small for the interior, large for the edge. I think ultimately, though, he ends up as an interior type player, but he's probably just going to be a chess piece where he goes. He's going to be moved around a lot, maybe first and second down. They do uh, have him on the outside, but then I think on third downs, he's going to be an interior type of rusher and disrupt the the game that way. Yeah, and I mean, I felt that way last year about Lucas Van Ness. Like, they, everyone said he's an edge, but to me, it's like if your hand's always in the dirt and you're lined up between the guard and the tackle, like, I'm going to classify you as a defensive interior. But the Packers yeah. did use him as an edge more than I expected them to. And I think a little bit to his detriment, you know, like I think he probably should have played a little bit more with his hand in the dirt. Um, but again, it, it depends on where these guys go and how you use them. I think there are a few other guys that I really liked and just want to mention quickly. Idisa Isaac from Penn State is my next guy up, number seven for me. Uh, a really, really special player. Uh, and honestly, like when you watch the film of Chop, you sometimes are like, oh, who's that other guy? Because he really is that good. Uh, 22 years old, 6'4", 247 pounds. Um, just a, a really high-end player, did a lot of things well. Uh, him and Jonah Ellis to me are the next two guys, Jonah Ellis from Utah. We've mentioned him a little bit in past episodes, 6'2", 248 pounds, 21 years old, uh, NFL lineage with his family, right? Those guys to me are the next guys I would take. And I think both of them end up going either mid to late second round. That's pretty good group to have seven or eight guys that you're talking about as, you know, top 45, 50 picks. I think we're a little spoiled at wide receiver in this class. So when we, we look at some of these other positions and go, ah, all the good ones are, are gone by the end of the second round. It's like, well, just because wide receiver stretches to like the fifth. I mean, that's the, this is more normal and in line. So the I mentioned Adisa Isaac in a previous episode. I mean, phenomenal player, consistent disruptor as well. He would have been a top 20 pick if he hadn't torn his Achilles a few years back. And then, you know, had to sort of recover from there that that sapped what was going to be a three and out first round type of pass rusher for for Adisa Isaac. And he recovered well to be a more complete player, but you're never quite that same player after an Achilles tear. And you see it with that first step explosion when you watch Chop and Adisa Isaac alongside each other and just the get off play after play after play. You see the difference. Mm -hmm. Go back and watch 2020 Adisa Isaac. It looked just like Chop. But in a bigger frame, because Chop, because uh, Adisa is bigger, longer. Adisa had it all, so um, I think now in his role, he's still going to be a, a consistent pass rusher in the league. But I don't think the ceiling is quite there. He's going to start for eight years, seven to nine sacks per year type of guy. Going to be loved by the fan base, loved by the coaches, be a consistent, steady presence. But when you're talking edge, especially in all twenty-two. You're going for that game breaker. The position is too valuable to just be steady. Steady is good, but a game breaker at that position is what helps you win games week to week. And so, which pretty much mirrors the NFL too, right? It, it's great to have steady guys along the edge, but if you don't have a game breaker there, you're at a real disadvantage. And so I think that's that's where Adisa Isaac sort of falls out of the top five for me, because at least I could say if Trice just kind of puts it together and finishes, he's got some pop, right? With Adisa, it's more very complete player. What you see is what you get. He's going to be super consistent. He's going to be an asset for you, but he's not going to take over games. I want mm -hmm. to chase somebody at the edge position that's going to take over games, and I think that's the the delineation between guys like like Jonah Ellis and Adisa Isaac from the rest. Uh, Jonah Ellis as well. I don't see a game breaker there. Good player. Uh, you know, you look at the frame and 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 you wonder a bit, but other than that. Uh, just good players, but I'm chasing, I'm chasing the ceiling at edge. I think edge is a position you have to chase ceiling because of the way the game is and what you need at that position in order to disrupt these high end potent pass offenses. Yeah. Jonah Ellis to me is a guy that I think maybe teams did him a disjustice, not telling him to be a stand up linebacker. Like with that frame, if you know, he obviously has NFL lineage to his name. Like there's a good chance this guy was going to make it to the next level He's not big enough, though, to be an NFL edge. He could be rotational, and I think that's what he ends up becoming in the NFL, which is still valuable in all 22 because as long as he hits that snap uh, count minimum and if he's getting valuable snaps that work to his kind of strengths, it's a guy you want. But it is you know, limiting to the ceiling that he can have. The reason we stopped at those guys, because in my opinion, that top seven or eight that we talked about, that's really in an all 22 draft where I would say, 
okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really drafting anybody else. Like that's where I'm kind of putting the line in the sand and saying, all right, if I, if there's another guy, I'll get him in free agency or I'll let somebody else take the risk. Like I think a Chris Braswell from Alabama falls outside of that for me, even though I do think he's a good football player. I think he has a lot of value NFL draft. He's probably a mid third round pick. Uh, but to me, it's just, I don't think he has the frame to be a truly successful NFL edge. We talked about guys that did not play or did not play at the weight that they went to the combine in. This guy's 251 pounds met, uh, weighing in at, but like to me, he looked way smaller in college. So I just, I just don't know if I see him being that high level edge player in the NFL. And then just one thing we didn't touch on the all 22 era and how we have these top guys. I had three of these guys make my list. So my top three were Turner verse and Latu. So where did they land? So I had Chase Young being my number one of the guys that we've reviewed in that 2020 to 2024 range. Obviously he hasn't really panned out, but it might be more for personal reasons than anything else. Will Anderson last year uh, ended up being my number two with Aiden Hutchinson as my number three. I really liked Kayvon Thibodeau, and I think I learned a lot of lessons from how he ended up being in the NFL. So he's my number four. I still think there's a lot of room for him to grow. I have Dallas Turner right behind that at number five. I think he's, again, very good player. Speed, speed, uh, arsenal, strength, way to fight through pressure, way to fight through uh, contact. I think he does a great job in that. I have him right behind Thibodeau. Miles Murphy was right after that. I love him. I think he was more of a long-term project, so I'm definitely not counting him out yet. Quiddy Pay, right behind that. I love some of the things that he's done in India already. I think he's a, just a really solid player. And along those lines, I have Jared Verse right behind Quiddy Pay at eight. Again, a, another really solid player. Uh, Nolan Sp Smith was my nine. Haven't really even seen him yet, but with the Eagles shipping out Hassan Reddick, we, we should see a lot more of him. Gregory Rousseau is my 10, Trayvon Walker, 11, Jalen Phillips at 12. I have Layatu Latu right after him at 13. I think the commonality between those two guys is pretty obvious. They had all the talent in the world with a ton of injury history. And you have to kind of weigh your risks there. And that's why I have him as low as I do at 13. Tyree Wilson for his high end athletic ability was my 14. Lucas Van Ness kind of rounds out that top 15 uh, right there at 15. Curious if you actually did yours, but, um, you know, do you have, <laughs> I just ranked him for this class because I had a hard time really slotting Turner, but who was your top four? Yeah. You had so young Anderson, who in Thibodeau? Hutch and Thibodeau. Hutch. Okay. You had Hutch pretty high. So I haven't slotted these guys yet in my, in my all 22 era rankings. Right. But I had, <laughs> if you guys remember, but, uh, so Young Anderson, Nolan Smith, Thibodeau, and then Hutchins five top mm -hmm. right in my top five. And so I like to kind of how I work is like I'll look at the the top in this class and go where do I slot him right, and then that kind of helps with the rest of these guys. And I still don't know what to do with Dallas Turner, so I'm like, you know what? If I'm not really ready to rank these guys, I'm just not going to just yet. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take a step back and and see, you know, take a little yeah, time, and make sure I get it right. What'd you say? I said, see how Chris does it. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, totally. That, that's, that's, that's it. And see how you do it. Um, uh, where do you have JJ McCarthy ranked again? So, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, yeah, I, I mean, everyone knows I, I love Nolan's, but they still do. I mean, he, he, he busted up his shoulder in the preseason last year and it basically ended up becoming a lost year, but he's in line for a bigger role. We'll see how this plays out. But once I know where the heck I really want to slide Dallas Turner after those guys, because a part of me, looking strictly at prospect to prospect would have him above someone like Aiden Hutchin Hutchinson, who's currently five. But, but I don't know. I go back and forth on it because Hutch is certainly the better player today. Today, meaning like when he was entering the league versus Turner now today entering the league. Um, so it's still a bit for me to sort out. And then it's like, I think, I think honestly, Chop would probably be back to back. They, they might be right after each other. Um, giving the other names Ooh. there, not necessarily because those, uh, those two are actually pretty close. I, I will say that, but after those, the, the, the really top four, in my opinion, names in the last five years, there's, there's not that many game breakers. There's, there's really not. And, and I wasn't quite as high on miles Murphy as some others. So maybe that plays a part in it as well. I, I wasn't too high on him. Definitely wasn't high on someone like Greg Rousseau, um, or, or Tyree Wilson. I just said Tyree Wilson. Yeah, lottery ticket. Maybe he hits good arm length, whatever. Um, so 
I think it's very top heavy at edge. And then from there, it's it's like the, the I always say the soup. It's kind of like the soup. And I think the prospects in this class are borderline that top tier and then the soup. They're like right at that line between soup and top tier. And I'm not sure quite yet who's gonna who's gonna make it above that line mm-hmm. from this class. If they do, it's only gonna be it's only going to be some combination of uh, verse Turner and chop. I just got to sort that out because like I said, it's they're there for me. It's it, we, we definitely value different things at edge. You and I, of course. And, and I think that's right. Every team has different things that they like at edge. I like bigger guys. Like I like a little bit more power, a little bit more strength. That's why I liked miles Murphy so much. Right. Like to me, I looked at him and like Marcus Davenport was like that. Right. It's like, even though these guys weren't, fantastic play in and play out i look at them and say wow there's so much to unlock right where you know you have nolan smith as your three you said like that's yeah that's that's a different that's a completely different player right and i think nolan smith or excuse me dallas turner is more of the nolan smith mold than you know a a miles murphy right like it's 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 just pick your poison pick what you like i do think dallas turner has more to his game than nolan smith did last year Obviously, different opinions, and obviously Nolan Smith was the better athlete, but I think Dallas Turner has more to his move arsenal. He has a little bit more power and strength. I just, again, I value that more, so that's why he's going to be a little higher for me than he was for for you. Yeah, I'm not. I wasn't a big bench press guy uh, growing up, as you know. So I'm I'm more about speed. How quickly can you get 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 off the blocks? But yeah, that's that's what it is. It's it's all flavors of ice cream and. The great thing about all 22 is it's, it's fine, right? You, you can pick the players that sort of suit your profile, right? Because there's more than one way to skin a cat. You could be a top 10 pass rusher any which way as a power rusher or a speed type guy, or just absolute freakazoid like Micah Parsons. Um, it all depends. And so, uh, and that's the kind of the, the, the cheat code, right? Is that Micah Parsons didn't really fall into any position group here because he was mostly a linebacker early on before moving to edge, even though I did say edge was his best position. And I mean, you know, if, if, if we had him as edge, he was my edge one, uh, coming into college bar none way ahead of all these other guys, uh, chase or anybody else. So, uh, that's the other part of this too, is where, where did they slide in positionally when they were entering the league? But yeah, that, there's... Sucks. that sucks for me too. Cause like I, I yeah. again, yeah, he came in the league as a linebacker. So I have him as a linebacker, but like Jack, that means Jack Campbell's my number two. And I would have much, I like my <laughs> ranking so much more if Michael Parsons is my edge one than Jack Campbell is my linebacker. Or we could do whatever we want. We could change the rules. I mean, cause no, I mean, Michael Parsons today paper. is today. He's an edge. Like he started out as a linebacker for about like eight weeks. And yeah. then uh, once, uh, you know, when someone got hurt in, in Dallas, they moved him down to the line and mm-hmm. the rest is history. He destroyed the chargers and they just kept him there. Uh, but we could change the rules. We could say he's an edge today. So where would he be in my edge rankings? Edge one. There, there you go. Yeah, 100% Nothing he's wrong edge with that. It's not even yeah. close. It's exactly. not even close. Like I didn't, that's the thing is like, I don't love, I never loved Chase Young. I never loved Aiden Hutchinson. Really? Like, I never loved Chase Young. Okay. No, I didn't. But like, to me, it's, they're the best. They're the best of what we've seen. But that, what that really mm-hmm. means to me is like, it's been a while since we've seen Miles Garrett's Nick Bosa's. Like, I don't think we've seen that enter the draft in, in, a few years and again michael parsons came in the league as a linebacker so i'm just holding yeah. myself accountable to that it's like he wasn't an edge so i like you i can't count him as that but like it's been a while since we've seen that level of edge rusher enter the nfl i think will anderson is probably the closest, closest and I, I almost wish i made him edge one last year but i didn't so i'm gonna hold myself to it we just we haven't seen it in a few years Yep, that's exactly right. The best one was disguised as a backer. So uh is what it is. But yeah, so this this edge class is the top of it anyway. Like I said, to me, right around that soup. But again, like you said, different people value different things in edge, and you can win in multiple ways as an edge rusher. So, you know, trust your own eyes. And if you're on the clock in a rookie draft and someone fits your profile, then by all means take them there because that's 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 your model to win. So have at it. That's right. All right, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at all22 underscore PFF and give us a review wherever you watch or listen to your podcast and have a nice day. I'm a ghost.